Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're interviewing a good friend of mine and fellow teacher, Mr. Kyle Butler. Now Kyle was born and raised in the Pentecostal Holiness Church and by the time he was 23 years old he was already serving in full-time ministry. And so I've been interested to interview Kyle for a while now because I knew that we had similar backgrounds uh, in terms of you know being born and raised in the church and serving as a full-time pastor and then having a spiritual awakening experience. And so Kyle and I had a really great conversation about the concept of expanding consciousness and his personal journey out of fundamentalism, which he describes was all due to a still small voice that began speaking to him from within. So I'm sure many of you listening will be able to relate to that. So with that being said, please enjoy Kyle Butler. Welcome back to Moving Backwards, episode 15. Today we're joined by a good friend of mine and special guest, the one and only Mr. Kyle Butler. Kyle, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. This is beyond an honor. You, you know, really is. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it. We've been uh, Facebook friends for a while and, you know, sharing each other's stuff, you know, and all that good stuff. But um, I've been excited to have a chance to talk with you because, you know, you're one of those people, I think I told you this already, but... You're one of those people where like pretty much everything I see you post, I'm like, oh man, this guy gets it. Like just pumps me up, you know? And uh, we post about a lot of the same stuff too. Mm -hmm. And what really intrigued me was a post you had uh, maybe a few weeks ago where you talked, uh, you went into some detail about your background, how you grew up in the church yeah. and how, how and why you came out of fundamentalism and why you started questioning things and that really piqued my interest because, you know, I have a very similar background too. So what I really want to know initially about you is um, how you sort of grew up in religion, you know, what denomination you're part of, what ministries you're involved with, and then like what it was about your church slash religious experience that caused you to start questioning things and opening up to a more expansive view of God. So I grew up in, in a, a Pentecostal holiness denomination. Oh, okay. And, you know, one thing about denominations, you don't know that it may not be good until you realize one day, wait a minute, there's more out here. Oh. Um, you know, we grew up in an environment where when I say Pentecostal holiness, that holiness was a big deal. <laughs> and that... that <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, sure 95 to 99 percent of everything we did was was based upon is it holy? Yeah. yeah so yeah. we we had a tremendous long list of things we couldn't do. Oh man! I, I remember as a little boy saying, "Oh my God, I'm so happy I'm not a girl because my sisters couldn't wear pants, and um, we couldn't go to the movies, we couldn't listen to wow. music. Wow. Um, you know, it was extremely extremely limiting, and you know, I. I was, I was always smart as far as I just, you know, I was able to figure out life very early. Yeah. And, and my early walk away from that was, man, this God dude, he doesn't want us to have any fun. <laughs> 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 you know, because. God and fun just don't mix, man. Sorry. They, they, they didn't go together. You know, they just didn't go together. So as I got older, you know, in, in, in a young teenager and, and really got involved in ministry at that age, at around 13 or so, I, I started framing it this way. Well, God wants us to have fun. He just doesn't want us to have the wrong kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Besides going to church. Exactly. That was the only time he, you know, at least the, the, they told us he was happy with us. He right. was pleased with us when we were in church. And we were in church all the time. I mean, yeah. All yeah. the time. Yeah, all the time and, uh, you know i remember so many summer days we're outside playing with our friends and it's five o'clock and my mom is yelling out the window uh time to come in the house and get ready for church and all of my friends are like laughing in the background mm -hmm. because we have to go in the house to get ready for church because every other night was a revival all summer <laughs> long so oh man the nostalgia bro the nostalgia yeah. <laughs> Those were the golden days, man. Yeah. <laughs> I remember a little boy, it's 10 o'clock, 1030, and the church is still popping, and I'm going to sleep on the back pew somewhere 
because I'm just, I just want to get out of there. And I remember 12 o'clock, one o'clock, a lot of nights rolling out of there. And it, it was really almost, um, you know, a situation where we just want you here. If we can get you here seven days a week, well, that's what we want you seven days a week. And, yeah. 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 Otherwise you'll be out drinking and sleeping with all yeah. toilets and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Because <laughs> you're wicking the brave, brother. You need Jesus. <laughs> exactly. I guess uh, the next thing I want to ask you is what would you consider, or if you could look back in your memory, uh, what would you, how would you label like a defining moment for you where you like something clicked and you're like, I'm not into this anymore. Yeah. That took a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got into ministry er, very early. I was, I, I started at 13. I had my first little trial sermon Wow. by 21 i was being ordained into ministry whoa uh, 23 i was being ordained again as an elder uh in 26 i was being installed as pastor oh my gosh um, and this is primarily growing up and it's in a church and just one denomination hearing one message one way yeah um i never thought to question things because you 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 know when i came in we had a, a pastor there and and everyone gave him great respect. And, you know, to me, he was this great, powerful man. I mean, we saw things happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, we saw miracles and signs and wonders. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he, he knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. So you never think to question anything. Right. You know, uh, um, you know my mother was in church. My dad wasn't. Uh, she, she was an evangelist eventual, eventually. And, and so to him, he was my male father figure he was the one i looked up to he was the one who in my opinion showed me what a man is and mm -hmm. first being godly and then you know financially responsible and yeah so on and so forth but um so i i just kind of jumped right in right <laughs> under his shadow and never really thought to question anything however on the inside i was never at peace mm -hmm. and the the you know, the funny thing is I would go to church and we'd be doing our ceremonial type things. Uh, I, I remember like we'd have prayer nights, two nights a week. So uh, in this format, we'd go in there and we'd have to get on our knees and pray for an hour and then get up and, you know, have some songs and the someone would give a message. And I remember so many of those moments where we were on our knees praying and, you know, the, the, the prayer would open up and someone would take over the prayer and Lord, we need you, Lord, come on by Lord, this and Lord, that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I remember so many times wanting to get up and say, will you guys just shut up? Like, you know, <laughs> why are you begging? It, you know, it, yeah, <laughs> it would just yeah. bother me the format and the way we would do it. And I thought, you know, I thought, man, I, I must have a, a demon inside of me. Cause you know, I, I don't know why I feel this way. Uh, you know, I later on, realized that that was really just a spirit of truth inside of me saying, yep. son, this just isn't it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you just kind of went along with the course, but you know, you haven't let me show you anything. Um, so it really wasn't until about 2007, you know, I, I started asking questions and that was only because I found myself in a situation where I was so afraid of another financial collapse Mm. that um, I, I finally opened myself up to take a deeper look at things that I was being told and I had believed. Um, and then that, that led me into 2008 when one day uh, Papa said to me, son, you have no idea how big my grace is. And then that's really when everything started to change. Mm. So you had a, like a personal experience with God in like a prayer type setting or what? I would just, it was just, I was in the house and I was just, I was walking from the back of the house to the front. And, and, and I remember I, I, I had walked past the room where my mother was. And just as I was walking back, you know, he would, he just said to me, son, you have no idea how big my grace is. And, and mm -hmm. I said, well, show me. Mm -hmm. Now I remember when he said that in my mind, the only thing I can think of was my grace is sufficient for you. Now, mm -hmm that message never did anything for me. It, no. it, it, it always frustrated me because from the way we were taught it and the way I eventually taught it was, you know, Hey, if you're going through something hard, if you're, if, if you're, 
if you're having a really hard time or you're suffering with something, God will sprinkle you with a little grace and you mm -hmm. carry that on, that struggle on through with yeah. that sprinkle of grace. That's you all I knew. Scrape on by, but it's right. you just, our teeth, you just, brother. You just suffer on through with it and <laughs> smile because of grace. Yep. And I never understood why Paul got excited about this thing. And I said, well, that's Paul. He's stupid. You know, <laughs> you know that's nothing to get excited you about. You know what he's talking about. <laughs> Yeah, tell tell me you're gonna take the thing away. I'll get excited, but tell me I gotta suffer through it. That that's stupid to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, with me and with me and Dad, it, it's always been a, it's really always been an inside out relationship. Mm -hmm. I didn't always realize it to be such. Um, and and most of the things that I had learned, I really never learned it by studying or hearing someone else yeah. preach it. It was always just something that would I would hear on the inside, and I would have a knowing, but maybe I wasn't, I wouldn't have a confirmation, so to speak, because I, yeah. I I I hadn't heard anyone else say these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I hear someone else say, it and I think, oh yeah, that's right. You know, you had, you had mm -hmm. showed mm -hmm. showed me that. So it, that's really kind of how it all started, and uh, that's when I started asking questions. When when the when grace began to reveal itself to me and. And it, it challenged every single thing I had ever believed from oh. work to performance to rest to finished. I mean, so many of those things, it, it just challenged every single aspect of everything I believed. But I was so open at this point, Aaron, because I'd gone through this religious cycle for all these years and really felt like, man, I've got nothing out of this. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. I've got nothing to show for it. There, there's no reward I see there's no benefit to this thing you know you guys kept telling me just keep doing what you're doing one day God will bless you and I started asking the question well God either you're extremely slow at returning rewards and blessings <laughs> or I'm doing something really wrong yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know? and so I just kind of settled on the fact that I must be doing something really wrong yeah and needed yeah. a better a better understanding of things man you said a lot of really good stuff there. Um, the, one of the things you said that really caught my attention was uh, you said the voice of truth spoke yeah. from within you yeah. and told you. And so one of the things that uh, I'm really interested in is the idea of, of expanding consciousness. Um, there's just the most phenomenal way that God opens our awareness to more variables uh, of his nature. And you start to realize as you get older that every experience of your life is serving to expand you and grow. Yeah. And it's almost like we're evolving into greater understanding of who he is and what he is like uh, from glory to glory. Right. Right. And so that's kind of how it's played out for me is that, um, you know, I've had a couple of what I would consider like spiritual awakening moments in my life where you start to just go, hold on. I think I've, the paradigm I've been operating on isn't the highest truth. Right. Yeah. And so then you, this hunger builds in you like, I want to know what the highest truth is. Right. And then you kind of go to the next level and it, it has to unfold that way because you can't skip layers. Right. You have to go from the step you're at to the next step. Um, which is why when you do expand, uh, your consciousness and you maybe you leave the religion you had grown up with because you're seeking for uh, deeper truths, you know, the people that you left judge you call you a heretic. Sure. But you look at them with nothing but understanding and compassion. Sure. Because you were there, right? Right. And you right. just know that they're just operating from an incredibly limited framework. Right. And so you can't really blame them for their religious beliefs or their behaviors right. because at one point you believed that stuff too and you were trapped in that limited framework. And it was only God in his grace in, you know, through the voice of truth within you that called you to a higher level and you answered the call. But, um, you know, the, the claim of heresy and blasphemy is always coming from an insecure ego. Because mm -hmm. it's looking up at someone who's, you know, religion always calls a higher view of God blasphemy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. it's a threat, right, to their current yeah. paradigm. Um, but the higher perspective never looks down at the previous one and calls that heresy. No. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of a dead giveaway that whenever someone is using the claim heresy, and, you know, I'm sure you get it all the time still. I get it all the time still. Um, even from some people that are, you know, progressives and have, quote, unquote, left fundamentalism, the second they're confronted with uh, a viewpoint that doesn't line up with theirs, they start saying heresy again. 
And I'm just like, man, you're still trapped in, in fundamentalism. Like you're still not free, you know? Right. And so you can have total mercy and compassion for them. But at the same time, they're sort of telegraphing their own insecurity. And it's through, but it's through that experience that you had and that I've had of being trapped in that mindset. Um, sort of like, I love the analogy of like a butterfly in a cocoon. Um, you know, when a caterpillar is growing into a butterfly in that cocoon, it starts to get so tight when it grows that it starts to suffocate and die. And so it starts thrashing around trying to get out of the cocoon and then it breaks out. Like it doesn't know it's becoming a butterfly. Right. It's just trying to survive. And that's kind of how it is when we see God. It's like, we don't know what we're transforming into. Uh, we don't know the next vision of God we're going to receive. We don't know anything other than I just have this deep burning hunger to know you. It's a no yeah. truth, you know? Yeah. And when you have that, it doesn't really matter who calls you a heretic or not, you know? No, no, not at all. Um, so the next question I have for you then is, um, can you speak a little bit about the importance of always being able to question what you believe and why that would be a beneficial thing rather than a dangerous thing? You know, you, you mentioned the, the ego, the, the mind, and the ego mind, the egotistical mind that we, we've learned how to really what we think flourish in, right? So from a very early age, we learn to kind of take the ball and, and create our own course and plot our own path and, you know, choose our own journey, so to speak. And, you know, it's all up to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we take that from a young kid and we form this, this mind, it becomes more egotistical and more egotistical along the way. And in that what I call a lower consciousness of thinking or the, mm -hmm. the, the, the egotistical mindset, we develop absolutes yeah. and we, we frame these absolutes around us and, you know, we, we make them our little uh, sanctuary, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so God is this absolute and grace is this absolute and mercy is this absolute and judgment is this absolute. And, and we, and we're, mm -hmm. once we get them, and we, of course, we frame them out of this lower consciousness of thinking, this ego mind, this mind that says, you know, you're kind of, you know, your own version of your, your, your best self or something like that. And mm -hmm. so in our intellect and what we think is our, 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 you know, source of intelligence, we just come up with these absolutes, i.e. $40,000, 40000 denominations mm -hmm. you know the 40,000 group of people in that egotistical mindset mm -hmm. developing an absolute well it can only be this yeah all the rest of you are wrong they're all exclusively and, right <laughs> right right exactly <laughs> and you know if if we're going to build absolutes and in, in my opinion now I was just telling uh, Derek just the other day we were talking the only absolute that I'm willing to, to conclude on is that God is unconditional love. Mm. And, and, and to me, that's the only thing that is absolute to me. Yeah. Now, outside of that, there's no other absolutes. We're children. He's our father. Mm -hmm. And in the model of a child to a father, a father to a child, it, as long as that relationship is intact and going, well, the child's always going to be learning something from the father. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what we'll be doing. I think mm -hmm. we'll be learning something forever. Yeah, it will always it be with our father. So I don't look back on people who are still, and, and I, I hate to use the phrase where I was, because right. I, I don't want to make it seem like I think I've, I've advanced beyond anyone. Mm -hmm. But I don't look back on people who thought like I used to think hey, you guys are stupid or crazy or insane or why don't you see it my way? Mm -hmm. Hey, you're just at a phase of your journey. I'm just at, at this stage of my journey. Someone else is at this stage of their journey. And I think if we can just all accept this truth that we're all on a journey. Yeah. And, and I think that's the beauty of this whole thing. Let's just sit back and enjoy the journey because Papa's already put it in place and he's seen everything that will ever be. And he's, he looked at it and said, man, this thing is wonderful. It's great. Right. And that's how we should do it. Just look at it like, wow, another wonderful moment in the journey. Yeah. Cause you and I are both different expressions of him. Exactly. And so it's exactly. like him meeting himself in a different way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess from that perspective that you just laid out, the only real heresy 
would be to not question, to not expand, right. to assume that I have got infinity figured out. Right. Right. That's arrogance. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why religion is so arrogant, right? That's why people that are very religious tend to also be very prideful about it and very like ardent. And if you don't believe like me, you're wrong for sure. You know. And I think one of the things for me that started to, uh, even at a very young age, uh, I started to question deeply was this idea of, you know, obviously we talk about hell a lot, but it was the idea that um, in my denomination, they always called hell, they, they didn't want to, they didn't want to label hell as this fire torture chamber, because that sounds way too bad, right? It's like, oh, yeah. we preach about love all the time, we can't really go there. So let's just call it um, a place where God isn't, the absence of God, that's what hell is. So it's some dimension you go to where God is not and you're, you're in total absence of his presence. That's hell. And so for a little while, I was like, all right, that sounds a little nicer than burning people. Um, but at some point I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, how can you go somewhere that God is not? Yeah. Uh, if you could go somewhere God is not, where would that be? And uh, who's, who's supplying the source of that dimension where God is in? You know, like it doesn't, if we say God's infinite and eternal and omnipresent, omniscient, that doesn't line up with that view of God. And so, you know, like David says, where can I go from your presence? Even if I go to Sheol, you're there with me. Right. And then as I got older, that didn't make sense to me, that, that paradigm. Um, Cause I'm like, if, if, if they're in hell, then God has to be there with them because right. they're, they're God. They're part of God's being, right? There's nowhere else to go. Right. And so then I started to realize that, uh, everything is, everything relates back to consciousness. And from that perspective, hell is a dimension in consciousness, the same way that heaven is. And the way that Jesus spoke about it was that where I am there, you may also be. Right. He said, you know, if your hand causes you to sin or whatever, chop it off. Better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, the dimension of consciousness that I'm bringing, right. uh, demonstrating, than it is to have both hands and be in the dimension of consciousness of what we call hell or Gehenna at the time. And he used Gehenna to point to that dimension, right. you know, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he's not talking about literal weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's talking about <laughs> internal weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? right. Everything he said was, a, was parabolic and was representative right. of a metaphysical dimension. Right. And so, um, you know, for me, that, that was something that I started to see in my own experience that, there's been many times in my life where I am in hell, right? You know, and, right. and you can look at your experience of life and see all these people are in hell right now mm -hmm. and God wants to bring them out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can you talk to me a little bit about your experience with that paradigm and how that caused you to wake up to God's love and grace? Well, I grew up Pentecostal holiness and hell meant hell. Hell mm -hmm. meant you're going to burn forever. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I, grew up with the understanding that if you didn't get saved by the time you're 13, cause you got 12 years of grace. And by 13, <laughs> if, uh, was that, it? Know, was that actually 12 that they said? Yeah. Wow. Eight, well, yeah, the age of accountability because, you know, I grew up, Jewish. it was 12. Right. Right. Yeah. And so by, you know, our reasoning, you know, okay, we'll give you 12. And then after that, you got to be about your father's business. And so, then God's burning 13 year old girls in hell. Oh yeah. <laughs> Most certainly. So, you could imagine on my 13th birthday, the first Sunday after where I was, oh, man. right there at the altar. And I went back the second week and the third week and the fourth week because I remember going home after the first week and I didn't feel any different. I didn't act any different. I was still the antagonistic big brother. I was still messing with my sisters and getting in trouble. I mean, I was still doing all the things I was doing before. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel any different. So when I went back to church that next Sunday, I said, well, maybe it didn't take, or maybe I didn't say the right thing, or maybe it didn't stick, or maybe I got to do it again. So I went back to the altar. And for about five weeks straight, I went back to the altar every Sunday. And then one day, one of the deacons who had seen me go up there four previous weeks, pulled me aside and said, Kyle, uh, yeah, you don't got to come up here anymore. And I said, are you sure? Because I don't feel any different. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> probably about 2014, um, I had a thought. And again, I'm now I'm, I'm fully immersed in, in really embracing this, this, this revelation of God's unconditional love, how it can't be anything like I've ever been taught. Yeah. So this is what got me thinking about eternal conscious torment. Um, I was in my room, just 
watching TV and this thought hits me. So, 16 year old Muslim girl in a country where Muslim or, or Islam is the mm -hmm. predominant religion. Yep. She grows up in a household with loving parents. Mother loves her, father loves her, great household. They're good people. They're kind to their neighbors and whole not. She's Muslim. This is all they know. Yeah, they yeah. don't have Christian television in their TV cycle or, you know, uh, network or whatever. Yeah, uh, they don't have Christians and churches and a, a diversity that we have here. All they know is this. And to them, to this 16 year old girl, this is great. I grew up in a happy home. We've been loving people. We've helped our neighbors. We haven't done anything wrong. This 16 year old girl one day is at a cafe. She's sitting down having some coffee, kind of doing some schoolwork. Someone walks up to her and says, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want you to read this track. And they slap a track down in front of her and it's one of those turn or burn tracks, mm -hmm. right? And she reads it, she's terrified. She's, you know, she really doesn't consider it because she's terrified. So she kind of pushes it to the side. And she, uh, she goes out the cafe, Two weeks later, she's crossing the street and she gets hit by a cab and, and killed. Hmm. And now she's standing before God. And as this thought is developing in my head, of course, the next thing was, based upon what I had been taught, now you're standing before God and here's the time of great judgment. And the question hit me, is it fair for her? Who's, who only lived 16 years, which of mm -hmm. course all those 16 years wasn't in a conscious state of decision. Mm -hmm. Is it fair for her who only had a five minute interaction with someone who thought they was presenting the gospel to her, is it fair that she burns forever? How would she stand in front of pure unconditional love and he made this decision knowing exactly what this story is all about knowing everything about it seeing everything about it knowing mm -hmm. that she only had a five minute opportunity to accept jesus mm -hmm. and i thought about that and thought man that makes no sense whatsoever mm -hmm. that makes no sense whatsoever and i can't match that to love at all no nope. And then it just it just kind of ballooned from there. Once one scenario after another scenario after another scenario after another scenario after another scenario. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, everything that I was I had always really learned had come from the inside. Mm -hmm. Now I had the scriptures, some of the stuff you've quoted, of course, you know, our translations all say hell. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I knew the word was in there. I knew what it meant as far as the literal interpretation of it. So I had nothing at first to go on. And um, eventually I started hearing different people talk about it. Uh, Don Keithley was one of them. And mm -hmm. I remember as I was, I was having all these different thoughts and every thought I had would, would go and match it up against love. And I, I have this, this, this father type figure, he's 80 plus years old. He's one of my closest friends in ministry as far as an older mentor type person. And one day I'm at his house and we're sitting down and I'm like, Pastor John, you know, there's going to be so many people who won't have an opportunity like we've had to get to know Jesus. Like, do you really think God's going to burn them forever? And he says this to me. He says, Pastor Kyle, yeah, I, I think that, that, you know, God will find some grace for those kind of people. Hmm. And so all I kept hearing was loopholes. <clears throat> Loopholes, yeah, loopholes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> loopholes, yeah. loopholes. And so, of course, every loophole began to challenge this, 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 this again, this absolute that I had believed that if you don't get Jesus, you're burning forever. It's it's like, we got all these loopholes here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, he grew up in that culture, you know, it's cool. He's, he's cool there. Right, yeah, yeah, you know, well, he'll understand, you know, okay, you live in this indigenous village and you never really had a chance to understand. You couldn't read, you know, no one ever came to your village. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll give you a pass. So I thought, well, if, if there's passes being given, then maybe we've misunderstood, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Mm -hmm. And I heard Don Keefley say this, which kind of really put it together for me, was, it was on a post he had written, he said, um, I did the study. I, I, I looked it up. 
I, I searched up everywhere where the word saved is and everywhere where the word condemned is mm -hmm. and neither say saved means hell or nowhere does it say saved means going to heaven right. and condemned means going to hell. Yep. And I read that post and I thought, woo wee, it's that's, not that's it right there. That, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. And I inboxed him and I said, hey, you know, we've been Facebook friends for a while. I, I've watched you on YouTube some and I really appreciate what you've been posting. I got some questions, maybe you can help me out a little bit. And he said, yeah, 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 you know, we'll talk. And I gave him my number and he said, he'll call me. And uh, I'm not a pushy person, so I just left it out there like that. And he never called, <laughs> never called, never called. Nothing against him, he just never called. Uh -huh. And so it's probably six or eight months later on down the road. And now I'm, I'm definitely, without question secure in the belief that there yeah. is no place of eternal conscious torment mm -hmm. and guess what happens he calls <laughs> <laughs> when the student is ready the master appears exactly and i told him this story and i laughed about it with him i said you know it, it just really fits my model i i'm so much better when i'm learning from within yeah. you know had I called you and you kind of told me your point of view, maybe it would not have stuck as good as it's sticking now. Right, right. Now, when you tell me the stuff you tell me, I'm just like, amen, brother. Yeah, I'm with you, brother. You know, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I, I don't want to get into trouble per se, but I'll just tell you where I am today. So maybe I will get in trouble. Who Let's do it. Let's get into trouble, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we already I'm are. At, I'm at a place today where I'm thinking, you know what? Most of my journey has been more, so much more about learning from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay if I never pick up another Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm okay if I never go to another church service and hear another sermon. I'm okay if I never, quote, get on my knees and cry out before God. Mm -hmm. What, where I am right now, what I've come to learn, I'm totally okay on this path and this road that I'm on. And for me, I realize that I don't need them and we don't need them the way that we've been taught that we do. 100%. And we've taken the Holy Spirit, our teacher out of the equation. We've replaced him with a book that has been I don't have a problem saying this, just butchered by humanity over time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not afraid to think anymore. I'm not afraid to think. Hey, you know, that's a game changing uh, place to come to, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm not afraid to think. <clears throat> well, you've said something that I think the, the most profound thing you said that struck me is that you said that everything I know has come from inside of me. Yeah. And uh, I think that that is a a tall tale sign that you really are in touch with the voice of truth within you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, what, what other reason would Jesus have talked about the Holy Spirit? What other reason would we right. quote, quote, have the Holy Spirit if not to use it, if not to have it actually lead us and guide us into all truth. And right. so if you're really in, in tune with God and really have a relationship with God, God's in here. God's not in a book. God's not in a church. God's not anywhere external to you. Right. Um, when you're talking about the Muslim girl, what struck me was, uh, you know, that whole argument Christians will make about if you don't believe in Jesus, da, 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 da. But when you really investigate that idea, you come to the conclusion very quickly that it's, it must be impossible. It has to be impossible to actually reject God and right. choose Satan or whatever they want to term it. Right. That's the most right. ridiculous, uh, it's no shit possible. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. The only Jesus people reject would be a false version or a hypocritical version of Jesus. Absolutely. And why that's not starkingly obvious, I don't know. But you're going to tell me, you know, people, God doesn't send anyone to hell. They choose to go there. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I have this right. You know, you're you're going to be standing. Listen, see... All right. It's probably, essence, it's I'm thinking being, now more than ever, probably more of what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know. I don't really, you know, care so much about what they do. I want to stop at the no. Mm -hmm. You know, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no one, and I don't care what anyone says, there is no one who will have an encounter with pure love that can ever say no to it. It's impossible. It's who we are. It's our mm -hmm. essence. It's our being. It, in the depths of each and every one of us, 
we're all looking for that to be connected back to the source, so to speak. You know, plug me in. Once yeah. you plug me in, man, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Unplug me and I'm just back to normal. Yeah. So the ideal of it is, is just foolish, you know, and, and I think, again, it's just regurgitating this religious rhetoric we've heard. Yeah. And we haven't given it any thought. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's where most people are. They just haven't thought about what it is that they think they know. Yes. Because like you said, thinking is scary. Yeah. If I, if I think, if I question something I believe that I'm certain about, that opens me to the unknown. Yeah. And what's more yeah. terrifying to the ego than that? Nothing. Right. But, but the ultimate fact is that people do what they do because they know not what they do. They don't know. Right. They don't, they don't have the right framework. They, they don't have enough variables to the equation yet. And, you know, life is giving you more variables all the time. Every experience you have is expanding your consciousness more and more. And so as you gain more and more variables about what God is like, what the world is like, what the universe is like, eventually you get to that point where something clicks and you go, I can't hang on to this old framework anymore. Right. There's too many variables questioning it. I have to step into the next phase. And, you know, only, only what you could call suffering really does that for you. You know, you have to suffer from that paradigm enough to be nauseated by it and want yeah. to move away from it, you know. But that's why we have the voice of truth within us. And yeah. the cool thing about it is, you know, you already know everything that's true in that inner place. Right. Um, because truth is not a concept. It's not a mental thing. No. No. But, you know, when you, like, for example, you're in church and you hear a pastor say something that's profound, you've never heard anyone say it before. Right. Oh, oh, amen, brother. Yes, that's definitely true. How did you know? Right. You already knew <laughs> exactly. it was true. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's the truth in you that's resonating, kind of like the law of harmony, right? It's resonating mm -hmm. to the frequency of truth. And so when you learn how to follow that, um, so many Christians go, you can't trust that. It'll lead you astray. No, 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 no. Your mind is what leads you astray. Oh, yeah. This oh, yeah. never can lead you astray. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. The right. voice of another they will not follow. Uh, and so once you learn to distinguish between how the mind speaks and how the heart, how truth speaks, it becomes easier and easier to follow this rather than this. Right. Not only easier, it becomes way more interesting. Oh, very much so. You know? Very much so. You know, it's, in the heart of, in the mind of my heart where the truth lives and, and, and just dominates more and more daily, I no longer struggle with what it says. Mm -hmm. You know, in the very beginning of this deconstruction, I would struggle with it all the time. Mm -hmm. I would argue with it all the time. That can't be right. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, man, Kyle, just go with it, okay? Just go with it. You'll see it later on. You know, just go with it. Trust and obey. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, this whole thing with the consciousness and our minds and, you know, I, I call the mind <clears throat> of Christ a higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. And... And I call our egotistical way of thinking a lower consciousness. And, mm -hmm. and so now when I look at scripture, and I'm not a Bible freak or scholar. I've never been a Bible freak. When I looked at scriptures now, I really see it as really a, a book that is dealing primarily with thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's really just trying to get us back on course to think the way we were thinking before Adam's lower mm -hmm. consciousness kind of took over yep. and he decided to, you know, question what he should have never questioned um, and, and, and believe what he, what he should have never believed. And I think every story uh, parabolically and symbolically and allegorically are really kind of pointing us to our thinking. Mm -hmm. And I know we looked at it as a book of rules and be regulations about behavior and we've been on that wild goose chase trying to perfect behavior for all this time and it's never worked yep you know but you you set someone in a, in a place and begin to help them see with the mind of christ or that higher consciousness and, and become aware of what's true about them and what's always really been true about them you change the ball game right there yeah that's where it all starts to change that's what repent means yeah yeah right and, and yeah exactly when you look at john I mean, you would think that if the message should have been any different, if the message really was about performance and behavior and get the sin out your life and clean up your life and all this stuff we hear in church, if the message was supposed to be that, then that's what John would have said. Hey, guess yeah. what? Mr. Holy's coming. He's holy. 
he can't stand this nonsense you guys are doing. You better clean mm -hmm. up your act because holiness is coming in your house. Right? Boots coming up for your ass. Exactly. <laughs> he didn't say that, right? He no. said, listen, something's coming. And the only way you're going to be able to understand it and receive it and live in it is you're going to have to start changing the way you think. Yeah. And that was Re his message. He was preparing the way. Yes. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. Translation. Change the way you think for a higher dimension of consciousness is coming available. Yep. yep. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so good. Absolutely. Man. And when we see ourselves one with him, and I, and I, we didn't really get a chance to talk too much about our oneness, mm -hmm. which is the next phase after grace introduced me to unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And then grace and unconditional love took me together with, with both arms around me and walked me. I'm walking in the middle and say, hey, guess what? We're one. And I'm like, whoa. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some good news. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that message of oneness, the, the I and the Father are one, is yeah. only a problem for the ego, which sees itself as right. separate. It's mm -hmm. I and the Father are one is a challenge to the ego's identity of, well, I can't be one because I'm me, I'm separate, I'm this individual thing. But when you really investigate that mindset, that is arrogance to say you're sure. separate from God. Sure. Oh, you're separate from all that is? You know, where do you, so then please tell us where you get your life-sustaining source from. Right. What is, what is maintaining your existence at every second, if not God? And when you, when you come to that recognition, you have to be honest and say, okay, I, you got me. I am the father yeah. of one. Right, right. That's grace, right. man. Yeah, absolutely. Bro, this has been awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate thank you, man. Coming. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, good, man. Uh, I just wanted to make sure people know where to find you. Um, I know you have a YouTube channel. You do a lot of your work right. on Facebook. So tell us where mm -hmm. people can find you at. Yeah, most of, most of my stuff is on Facebook. I just like that platform better. For some Me too. Reason. Yeah. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, Kyle Butler. You just type in Kyle Butler, I'll pop up. I also have a website, kylebutler.com. You can go there and, and mm. do some contact. And really just ways to connect. And so if you go to YouTube, you can get to me. To Facebook through there. If you go to my website, you can get to me to Facebook. But what you are probably, you'll probably find most of my stuff. Um, and so th those are my primary sources of contact. Uh, we're doing some very exciting things on Facebook. Monday night we have a show called Grace Line. Oh yeah. On Tuesday nights we have another show called Thinking Into Greatness that just started. Oh, um, I love it. On uh, Thursday nights, I do another show, which will be right after this one in a few minutes um, on a three-court strand conference call. And then on Sundays, I'm part of a GOMA network where it's a, it's a, it's a small network right now, but the goal is to grow it to a 24-hour day, seven-day a week live uh, network where every single speaker is doing nothing but talking about God's unconditional love and unlimited grace. So um, that's, yeah, that's amazing. what we're doing. Yeah. So that's a uh, really cool idea. Yeah. 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 We just started that a few months ago. We got some great speakers on it so far. Um, myself and Lynn, Lynn Bennett Jr., Catherine Toon, Derek Day, mm -hmm. um, Michael Porter, Henry Harris just joined in. So, you know, I'd, I'd extend an invitation. I don't know if you do anything on a weekly basis, but hey, man, if you, know, if you want to be part of that, just let me know. We'd love to give you a slot, whatever slot you want. Yeah. Give a slot I'd be happy and jump to. Jump on man. there and. You know, we try to uh, keep everything on a live platform. Yeah. Um, but that's the heart behind GOMA. That just started a couple of months ago. What does GOMA stand for? Just scroll that. Uh, Global Online Ministry Alliance. Okay. Global Online Ministry Alliance. So, um, you know, so that's, that's what we're doing right now. And again, most of it's all on Facebook. So you can always yeah. find me there. And I'd love to see you guys. That's awesome. Friends. Dude, that's so great. I'm going to actually link, I'll link all those things you just mentioned in my show notes as well for people. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. The dude, Kyle, I love you, bro. Thank you so much for coming on. Love you too, man. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, bro. We'll chat again soon. Okay. Thanks. All right, bro. All right. Bye.